Sounds like it's good. All right, guys. Okay, here we are. What's up, guys? All right, why did I make that weird, weird gesture? What's up, guys? It's your boy Gusnov back at it again with the Gusnov show. Uh, hope you guys are enjoying yourselves. Today, today, we will be talking about what the future of humanity might look like. What the future of humanity like might look like, and let's put into context the situation that humanity is in right now. Now, when I was younger, I used to think, dang, it would have been really nice to live in a time where we, when we were a, when we would have been a spacefaring civilization, right? I would have, I would have really enjoyed to be able to see the stars. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I think many people have kind of echoed this sentiment where they're like born too early to see the stars, born too late to explore the world, right? It's a weird little middle, middle time in history. But what I would, what I would like to say is that where we stand right now may actually be one of the most important times in all of human history. Um... I mean, not exactly why, for the reasons why many people would say. So let's look at the, let's ha take a look at what the future might look like. Um, and first, let's, let's go back to first principles. One thing that you probably need for life, or at least humans need, well, it's one thing that humans need, is. Uh, I mean, forgetting air, food, water, all that stuff. Um, one thing we, we probably may very well need is gravity. Um, I don't know. What do you call it? <clears throat> if you don't have gravity, from my understanding, you lose bone mass. Uh, I think there could be vision problems associated with, with it. Maybe heart problems if you don't really have exposure to gravity. Lots of different things happen to people in zero G. And I think that long term, um, and, and maybe this isn't true, but humans are probably best adapted to environments that have at least some degree of gravity. So how do you produce gravity? You, you, you've all seen Star Wars and Star Trek and whatever, where they just walk into a spaceship and then there's artificial gravity. And that's always looked at on is something that's like some sort of bizarre like far future esoteric space technology um, but the thing is it's real and we could do it with modern day technology so there's two forms of gravity there's one well gravity in a, in a sense where it's actually usable towards to for people one of it one of the types of gravity that would be useful to us is uh, i guess planetary gravity where you have a massive object that essentially exerts a gravitational field on a person or whatever and well self-explanatory the other type of gravity is uh what is it centripetal force um an artificial gravity field generated with centripetal force so essentially like and i don't know you, you've probably done this before where you like spin something around let's say you spin a bucket around right without centripetal force the water would fall down as soon as you start spinning it, right? And you've all been on those, or you've seen those, uh, what do you call it, carnival rides where everyone gets strapped in and then it starts spinning around really fast and you could, you get sucked into the, you know, the the wall. Um, but but essentially, that's, that's essentially how you can actually create artificial gravity. If you have a rotating cylinder that, rotates to a sufficient speed and is a big enough diameter you can ensure that people don't get like sick you know that people barely feel the acceleration um and you could also create an artificial kind of gravity like feeling that essentially operates the same way so okay that's principle one the next principle is, well, and this is something we've already done. You can create an artificial habitat 
or habitation or whatever you want to call it in space. Um, now, one thing that I don't think we've completely solved just yet is radiation. The issue with space is that it's filled with cosmic rays, like stars exploding, ejects a ton of heavy particles and whatnot, um, and those go, what do you call it? The fractions of the speed of light. And when you, when you have these particles or other just micrometeorites or whatever you want to, whatever's out there, right? It can impact with, with uh, the human body or other things out there. And um, from my understanding, it can disrupt electronics. It can cause damage to spacecraft. And it can also um, cause a bunch of health problems for uh, people who are living in space. And that's one thing we still need to solve and there are ways to do it um, one of them could be you just have a very thick layer of water around a space habitation um, but essentially that's something that can be solved other than that we've created artificial habitations in space that work right they're pressurized they're temperature regulated and they work so Okay, let's get to the thesis where we've, we've done enough stuff. In the far future, given the fact that we can create artificial gravity and given the fact that we can most likely create an artificial habitation that people can potentially live in indefinitely, many people will probably start living in artif rotating artificial habitats where every single need that people have will be solved artificially. Namely, gravity, water, air, food, all this stuff. <clears throat> now, let's say we, you, you take a look at like one of these artificial habitations, right? Let's say it's 50,000 pounds, or let's say it's 500, 600, 1,000, 10,000 tons, or whatever, right? It's a big space station. It's pretty big, but compared to a planet, an artificial habitation is probably much more, I guess, much more efficient in the way that it utilizes the mass that goes into it for the sustainment of life, because it's all like very much engineered to be that way. In science fiction, what people say is, oh, you know what? People are going to go and just colonize planets. They're, we need to find a habitable planet. We need to find a habitable planet. I think that that's a very unrealistic way of of, of approaching. Um, how would you how would you say it? An interstellar, intergalactic civilization. Because we're probably never going to find a planet that's just like Earth. Just everything is very fine-tuned for life on earth and i i'd say it's, it would be i'd be surprised if we can find something that's 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 similar enough so that you don't really need a habitation um so so there's really two alternatives you either colonize planets where you just need to build a habitation on top of it right and then also you have to worry about uh well step back we don't need to worry about much but you can create a habitation on a planet and then well, I guess you do have to worry about getting out of the gravitational field. So that's a problem. Um, and the planet itself is a very inefficient use of resources just because all of the mass in the planet is going into making sure it's sticking together rather than, you know, being productive to your, you know, the, the structure of your habitations and all this other stuff. Right. So anyway, planets, I would say, aren't very good use of mass in space the alternative is we can use artificial habitations rotating we call them O'Neill cylinders that can house let's say a hundred to a thousand to forty thousand to a million whatever whatever number of people um, but things that can be fine-tuned for life now the vision of the future that I'm, I'm proposing which I'd say many uh, people who study 
what potential future human civilization could look like. Many, many of the scholars in this area, basically, I would say, say what I'm saying right now. Um, in the future, people will start utilizing the mass in a in stellar systems and constructing these rotating O'Neill habitation <coughs> habitations, rotating O'Neill cylinders. And, and maybe it's not even just an O'Neill cylinder. There's a lot of different things you can build, but that's the most simple one. But people will probably start building networks of these complicated space, you know, things. And eventually, when a sufficient time has passed and we've reached a Kardashev two civilization or something like that, you're going to have a massive swarm of these uh, habitations orbiting around uh, various stars. And that's essentially when, when what is it? Uh, was it Frederick Dyson or something? Dyson. When he came up with the concept of the Dyson sphere, he didn't think of it as oh, it's just a giant shell around a star. He was thinking about this. It's a it's a swarm of these, you know, space habitations around a star that are so dense that they essentially take most of the energy that comes from the star. Um, we can call that a Dyson swarm. But that's probably what what human future human civilization is going to look like. Which is pretty cool. And the cool part about this is, right, <clears throat> if one of these habitations can house, let's say, 10,000 people, and you have like a... How many, how many of these habitations would you need to blot out a star? I mean, you'd probably need billions, maybe even trillions of these things, right? Now, it's a trillion times 10,000. You do the math. But it's very realistic, I would say, that if we can get there as a human, the human species. If we can get there and if we can if there isn't like some major great filter <laughs> right in front of us that prevents us from getting to that magnitude I would say it's realistic for us to get there. <clears throat> and that would mean that, I mean just around one star you'd have trillions of people um let's let's i don't know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna find the thing but you have trillions of people around each star and you have millions to billions of stars in the galaxy right so potentially you could have a trillion times a billion or whatever or actually let's i i, I don't know if i don't know if a trillion is a decent estimate for k2 civilization but let's say like a hundred billion 100 billion people per star times a billion, a billion times a billion. Anyway, the point is, in the future, the potential number of people and living beings, for that matter, um, <clears throat> is probably going to reach an un unfathomable amount. And... And the thing is, the crazy thing is, that's real. It's not like, oh, I'm just making it up and it won't ever happen. It's not like this is Lord of the Rings or something that's completely, you know, like Star Wars, the Death Star, blah, 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 it's aliens. No, this is something that most likely will happen. And I think everyone on Earth should be striving for this to happen because this is the only... It seems to me to be the only pathway that humanity can really go in. Well, there's two paths. Either one, we stagnate and we stop progressing and we die and we stay on earth we stay on earth and we die or we go into the stars and that's the way that it would happen <clears throat> so anyway point is why is our time where we live right now in, at this time, time in history why is it so important and I would say it's extremely important because the seven, eight billion people that are alive right now, we hold on our shoulders trillions upon trillions and trillions of people. 
and the future and the decisions that we make today ensure whether these people live or die and i don't think it's i don't think it's a given that there that this future will happen i say that it's likely if we don't screw things up it's likely that it will happen if if we don't screw things up but we don't know if we won't screw it up so at the end of the day the point of the time that we live in right now is to in my opinion inter- create an interface and a way of interacting with technology that is responsible and will ensure that we don't end up accidentally destroying ourselves somehow um, yeah I mean let's say what what if what if plastic turns out to be something that like kills you in five years once it enters your bloodstream or I don't know that's probably not the case but let's say let's say let's say plastic did something like that right or after a certain number of years like whatever and let's say it became like it's ubiquitous now right we we haven't really had plastics for a very long time we don't really have very long case studies of what plastics do but we're just using it everywhere right and I'd say that's a very dangerous thing. That's something we should not do ever again in the future. Um, but let's say that, that plastics actually turn out to be something horrible. And humanity died from it, right? Which probably wouldn't happen. Or humanity was like very crippled. Or like let's say millions of people died from it. We need to ensure that as technology gets more advanced and more advanced and more advanced we ensure that when those new technologies come about we know how to interface with them responsibly and we don't just jump in with two feet and you know experiment with it on the entirety of humanity um i mean that that's that's one opinion that i have um and another one is just to make sure that you know we don't stumble fall go backwards you know or or start spiraling in a direction where we never come up to where we are right um anyway those are my two takes ways so the the goal of us right now is to ensure that the future can happen more now more than ever because right now is the time where i mean most modern technology has come to exist in a very 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 recent amount of time right humanity has been alive for what is it a hundred thousand two hundred thousand years something like that we've had our modern technologies our modern way of life for maybe a hundred maybe maybe even 200 years maybe 300 years but i'd say two to two to 100 years And, yeah, we need to figure out how to not destroy ourselves. That concludes the, I guess, um, non-premium portion of this uh, talk show. You can find the rest of this this episode on Gusnov.com. And, yeah gusnov.com check that out i think you'd really like it gusnov premium uh we have hours and hours and hours of content a bunch of stuff from unreleased comics to unreleased podcasts to unreleased videos stuff that is years and years in the making um and i think that you guys would very much like it we have think a five star rating right now lots of people have subscribed already tons of people have subscribed already and lots of people are telling me how good it is and i think you guys should definitely check it out see it for yourselves and at the end of the day one cool thing there is a one week free subscription period so you can sign up you don't need to put any money down and for free you could look at all my content you could download everything if you want you could literally download the raw mp4s mp3s mp2s mp1s all that stuff put it on your computer and then leave you could just leave and it doesn't matter um and unsubscribe and whatever and you have all my content 
can do that right now, right now. And yeah, do it now before I change my mind. See you later, guys. Bye.